were read than the mayor's cousin declaiming them in a slow drawl that was almost a song. When he finished, to the victors go the spoils. The deputy mayor knelt beside his Subaru, lifted, his, lifted the mayor's knife, then put it in the mayor's extended hand. Stan made a whiplash motion with his wrist and the blade of, his, of the butterfly knife, less than a quarter of the length of a bowie knife, flashed silver in the pallid light of the garage. We all withdrew to, more, to a more respectful distance, for the knife fight between Stan Bollixer and the mayor was on, and no one wanted to be caught in the middle of it. There are rules for the knife fight, and those are written down, but there are also customs. The mayor knows them instinctively, for many are his own, but most of his opponents do not. We suspect that inwardly the mayor is saddened by these vulgar bumpkins who enter combat with thin-lipped, badly feigned rage and leap directly to the mayor's midsection to end things at once with a slash to the nipple or a stab to the collarbone. The mayor finishes those opponents quickly. Stan Bollocks, there was not one of those. Eyes never leaving the mayor's Stan drew a, drew a long, slow circle in the air using the point of his knife, and again marginally faster, and so on, until he was looking through a circular blur of steel and arms spinning as fast as a propeller on a biplane. Did we hear the crick crack of a shoulder dislocating, the creak of sinew bending? Could any of us mark the precise instant that the knife shifted from Stan's whirling left hand to his right? Did any of us truly see the admiration? Respect, and perhaps a soupçon of fear, crossed the mayor's implacable brow. No, not truly. But we did hear the mayor emit a long, low growl, the only appropriate response to such a fundamental challenge, an alpha male warning cry that came from the depths of our ancestry. The mayor bent down, pulled a dollop of goose fat from, his, from the fold beneath his arms, and dipped it into the dust of the garage floor. As he stood, he smeared the filthy grease in long black lines under his eyes and over each brow, and then again at the edge of his jaw. Weapon clutched in his left hand, he raised both arms over his head like wings, and the, the tip of the knife scoring the bottom of the blood-red exit sign. The effect was fearsome. No one would leave without going through him. Stan flexed his arm and spun the butterfly knife, hand clicking, handle clicking open and closed, and bent his neck first to the left and then to the right. The mayor drew his breath over his teeth in a serpentine hiss. The butterfly knife solidified in Stan's fist. The mayor bellowed, and the knife swung in a crescent of steel that shimmered in the fluorescent afternoon. It might have slashed Stan's pe left pectoral in two, but his own blade met the mayor's as Stan ducked low and drove his opponent, his opposite shoulder, into the mayor's stomach. Stan let it cry and drew his blade down in a slice that might, on another day, have relieved the mayor of a kidney. The mayor skipped aside instead, then retreated and swung his free arm in a contraclockwise way to create a deadly momentum. The knife plunged and Stan shifted and the blade squealed across the windshield of the mayor's truck as Stan whirled in a failed attempt to slice a piece from the mayor's shoulder. It was too much. Stan shifting and whirling and the mayor, and the mayor caught Stan with his free arm hard in the chest and Tan, Stan, Stan doubled over. The butterfly knife would have been airborne had Stan not hooked his pinky through the handle. The mayor might have had it then. He brought his own knife about, holding it an inch above Stan's shoulder. It hovered there as Stan wheezed, then withdrew. The mayor stepped back, knife at his side, fixing Stan with an expression that might have been a grin of triumph or simply a mask of exhaustion. The parking garage fell silent, but for the, but for the increased frenzied clacking of typewriter keys from the Citroen's front, front seat. By degrees, Stan Bollocksers stood. The mayor raised his knife and pointed at his Stan like a deadly forefinger. Next week, same time, he said, same place. It is rumored that one of us, a new reporter with something to prove, filed a news bit about the battle, but her piece never saw print nor appeared on the internet. Before a week had run out, she had been transferred to the radio room where, it was said, she spent her nights listening to the police scanner for word of fires and crimes and other nocturnal catastrophes. The rest of us kept the pact, and the mayor kept us into a busy public schedule. Stan joined us in following him. How could he do otherwise? Following the mayor through the wards of his city was Stan's job as much as it was any of ours. When it came time for the mayor to declaim, Stan Bollocks' microphone had its place at the front of the podium. Stan was professional. If his eyes ever met the mayor's through the scrums, and if he ever felt the mayor taking his measure, well, he didn't let it show. Nor did the mayor, at least not in those moments. But we wondered, 
did the mayor's frenetic activity that week, shielding him in the midst of the children of the Smelt Community Center, Pools Summer Fun Day Camp, or the Cannery District Senior Snooker Club, indicate that his nerve was slipping? Or perhaps he was using the business of this and ceremony of his office as a kind of extended display, a demonstration that he, and not this cocksure pretender, was the leader of this tribe. But he was so shaken, we wondered, why hadn't he simply ended the knife fight the previous Thursday, taken his slice from Stan Bollocks's greasy shoulder, and called victory? On the following Thursday morning, several of us came in late to work. We'd been called from our beds by frantic city editors to join the night team in covering an atrocity unfolding in the food court of the old town abattoir mall. It was a terrible crime, a tragedy, but so immense that in those early hours, days really, no one could reliably determine what precisely had happened. Early reports indicated a, hall, a hail of gunfire erupting from the rendering gallery, perhaps, but injuries did not bear this out, and the theory did not explain the smashed masonry at the base of the fountain or the size of the holes in the ductwork. Although many had been knocked unconscious in the event, no one was treated for bullet wounds. Descriptions of the perpetrators were similarly vague and contradictory. Giant men, possibly of African descent, paid faces covered in cheap fabric, heads shaven, teeth emerging like tusks from their jaws. The abattoir atrocity, as our editors dubbed it, was an impossible story to tell that would not make sense of itself. Those of us called upon to help wrestle it into a narrative came in late, exhausted and dispirited. The only thing that kept us going was the resumption of the struggle between Stan Bollocker and the mayor, although, knew, although we knew we could never tell it. That was a story that at least we could understand. The knives flashed ribbons of steel through the air as the combatants danced across the concrete floor of the garage where it was not smeared with long slides of goose fat and back hair. A fluorescent tube sent a snowfall of shattered glass as the Bowie knife cut through it. The director of community services spent the second part of the fight huddled behind a Subaru, applying pressure to an accidental flash across his arm from the fine cone blade of the butterfly knife. Although it was, um, it was warm in the parking garage, the city clerk rolled up the windows of his Citroën and kept low as he clacked away on the minutes of the second installment of the knife fight. This one lasted longer than the first. The mayor's cousin called it at 27 minutes, 53 seconds, standing over the mayor collapsed on his back while Stan, similarly exhausted, propped himself against a cement pillar. The two may have been invulnerable that afternoon to, more, to mere steel, but middle age and the hot, dry, carbon monoxide rich air of the VIP parking garage were another matter. <laughs> Why don't you call it a draw, cried the director of community services, blood staining his fingers and necktie where he held it against his arm. Haven't you proved enough? The mayor drew a wheezing breath and fixed narrow eyes on the bureaucrat who looked away. The mayor turned back to Stan, who was coming out the other side of a long coughing fit. The end times, the mayor said, and sat still a moment before gathering himself up and quitting the reins. The words were prophetic. The following week's monthly city council meeting was attended by not only the mayor and all his councillors, but also the senior staff and their assistants, all of us and delegations from wards across the city. This meeting had been scheduled to go along. Merchants from Abattoir Mall had come with a petition demanding greater police presence and the installation of video cameras. There was to be a discussion of cost, a cost overrun on a light rail line into smelt, and a committee of residents were asking for additional stops to better service the rehabilitation hospital. The city's poet, poet laureate had composed three new stanzas of an epic retelling of our amalgamation 15 years ago. <laughs> and there was to be a presentation no later than 3 p.m. These things, combined with several dozen routine items, ought to have added up to a sometimes vigorous but relatively straightforward session, finishing no later than 7. Meetings under the Bay Area were famous for running with brutal efficiency. It was not to be. The merchants were joined by a local slip civil liberties group shouting down the abattoir mall manager's deputation, requiring the services of the city hall security squad in a recess to clear the chambers and restore calm. The debate continued for three solid hours after that, the matter becoming so confused with amendments that, on the clerk's advice, council finally deferred the item until the Christmas session. Through all this, the denizens of Smelt hovered at the back, stoking their grievances one upon the other until their matter came up, and as a group, they demanded that the light rail line be ripped out altogether and the remaining funds be reallocated to the restoration of the Smelt Arms Bijou, a cinema that had been derelict since the war but held many fond memories for the elder smelters. Despite vigorous lobbying by the mayor's staff, council sided with the deputants and narrowly voted to kill the rail plan. 
The poet laureate, meantime, had grown bored early in the meeting and, as poet laureates do, comforted himself with the contents of his hip flask throughout the afternoon. <laughs> when his time came, he had drunk himself into su sufficient belligerence to substitute an obscene limerick in place of his more sublime stanzas. While some of us might have commented that the limerick was an, was an improvement overall, the mayor obviously did not agree. The city is swirling in the toilet, he was heard to mutter, unaware momentarily that his microphone was still on. From the sky and heaven, but now 